Hi uh, guys, welcome. This is Jimmy. This is another show. We have here an honorable guest. We have here Mike. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about macro, about TA, about FA, and about cycles. A really exciting topic. Hang in there, guys. Uh, see you in uh, 30 seconds from now. Trade Limitless on HMX, the next-gen decentralized perpetual exchange. Trade crypto FX commodities with up to 1,000x leverage on the Arbitrum network. Benefit from low fees, multi-asset collateral support, and cross-margin flexibility. Check them out. From meme to utility, Floki has it all. NFT metaverse game called Valhalla. Floki University, DeFi, charity, and shopping. Floki is governed by the people, for the people. Floki, together, there is no stopping us. Welcome back, everyone. Hi, Mike. Uh, good to have you. How are you doing, my friend? Doing well. Thank you for having me, Jimmy. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, it's an honor to have you here. I know a lot of people are already familiar with your uh, with you and your work and your uh, handbook. Uh, they follow you on Twitter, but could you nonetheless give a you know quick introduction about you to those who don't know you yet? Sure. So I guess a uh, big picture. My name is Mike Singleton. I'm the senior analyst and principal at Invictus Research. Invictus Research is a boutique provider of macroeconomic and market strategy work. So on a high level, what that means is we study the economy. Uh, what it's doing right now, what do we expect it to do over the next, call it year to 18 months, and how we expect financial markets to react. So that means stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies, and crypto. So how did I get into uh, macroeconomic and market strategy work? Well, I actually began my career at a bottom-up fundamental investment firm called Broadway Investment Management. It was much more akin to, uh, say, how Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger invest. It was all about evaluating individual businesses, evaluating their competitive position, their management teams, their growth prospects, et cetera, et cetera. It was a great experience. I got a lot of responsibility from a young age. I couldn't have asked for a better uh, way to begin my professional career on Wall Street. That said, I noticed after uh, a few years on the job, um, I noticed that what drove the performance of stocks wasn't just the bottom up fundamentals. It wasn't just market share gains or a great management team or, you know, a quarterly beaten EPS or whatever, a lot of times it was the business cycle. And as it turns out, the business cycle tends to drive, call it between 60 to 80% of the price action for individual stocks uh, over any given, you know, period of time. Um, and there are certain regimes where it's even more than that, you know, famously all correlations go to one through recessions. So you could say through recessions, uh, you know, macro is driving hundred percent of the price action. And as you move up the, the sort of the spectrum, as you go from individual securities to sectors and factor risks to indexes, it becomes more macro and it becomes less idiosyncratic, right? Because as you go further up, uh, you start to get a larger and larger sample of the economy. Uh, if you're looking at a, a small cap biotechnology stock, that's going to be highly idiosyncratic. But if you're looking at a large cap stock that does business globally, it's going to start to have macro have more of an influence, right? That makes a lot of sense. And if you're looking at baskets of securities, say the entire industrial sector, well, that's going to be pretty much 100% macro. So uh, I can get more into our process in a second, but that's kind of a high level overview of, of what I do, how I got to where I am and what Invictus does. No, that sounds really super interesting. Um, just for our audience, how, how would you, what would be the definition of the business cycle? Is it like as in you know, the 10 year cycle or is it more uh, a little bit longer than the normal presidential cycle? So it's a good question. I think people in finance throw around the phrase business cycle a lot and it's become sort of a sort of a vague generic phrase. Well, what does it really mean? A lot of people say they'll use the baseball analogy and say, oh, we're in the third inning of the cycle or the seventh inning of the cycle. So at Invictus, we keep it really, really simple. The business cycle uh, defined broadly is really made up of three constituent sub cycles, the real growth cycle, the inflation cycle and the monetary policy cycle. And the reason that we focus on these three sub cycles is because they drive pretty much all of the price action in financial markets, right? So you could test that using uh, correlations and regressions and attribution analysis and whatnot. But the truth is we don't really care about macro variables unless they matter to financial markets. We're not policymakers, we're not academics. Uh, we're really invested in macro for one reason, which is because we want to make money investing and we want to help our clients make money investing. And so, uh, Macroeconomics has a reputation for being kind of an esoteric investment style and, you know, 
you watch the big short and you're like, man, what are all these huge words? What are these people saying? I don't understand really what's going on. It's really not that complicated. It's not easy, right? No one will say investing is easy, but it's, it is macroeconomic investing should be pretty simple. So, you know, if you only took away one thing from this uh, conversation, real growth, inflation, and monetary policy, those are the three primary drivers of financial markets. And those are the drivers of the business cycle. So when we talk about the business cycle at Invictus, those are the three things we're really talking about. Super interesting. I mean, uh, funny enough, the, the the topic or the title actually for today is uh, Macro Made Simple uh, with, with you, uh, Mike. Um, uh, just like a question, something like there's this debate about like Macro and FA slash uh, or uh, versus uh, TA. What, what's your take on that? So it's a good question. And it's funny, uh, the various practitioners within financial markets adhere to these different disciplines with Sort of a religious like fervor which is really i think very silly right i'm a fundamental analyst i'll never look at charts or i'm a i'm a technician and i'm, I'm never going to look at the fundamentals because price knows everything and i think the reality is uh they really work better together right i think that much every fundamental analyst would benefit from having some sort of technical training understanding how markets price things in understanding what a primary trend is right to go back to, to dow theory versus you know the, the smaller trends and I think every technician would benefit from having a macroeconomic understanding of the business cycle. What's the sequencing of the business cycle? When is the trend likely to break? Which way is it likely to break? What can history teach you? And uh, candidly, I think that macroeconomic fundamental investing and technical analysis go to go together like peanut butter and jelly. Really, there's no there's really no better combination of financial disciplines than global macro and technical analysis. And we spend a lot of our time at Invictus blending those two things together. Hmm makes uh, makes totally sense and i pretty much agree and i'm sorry to those who don't like uh peanut and jelly uh what was that uh, jelly um um uh, what, what was the the, the peanut the, butter and jelly yeah, tomato sauce yeah, and spaghetti yeah, 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 you know yeah. so uh, the, <laughs> yeah I, I think it's a really good um uh a combination uh to 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 use it for um you know to assess your directional bias um, maybe like also a good question uh, what I often get from um, uh, the audience is uh, when it comes to macro, where actually to start? Uh, you have this beautiful handbook and I'm sure pretty later maybe we, we can talk about this in more detail. Uh, one of the beautiful things uh, you guys have said is most investors are drowning in data. So there's actually this... Um, uh, um, uh, analysis paralysis they see so much information and they don't know uh you know what to think about that so how, how can they make this simpler for themselves hmm. okay so it's a good it's a good question so i think as an investor there's really two categories of there's two resources that you really really need to be successful one is you need data and one is you need sort of uh, um, you need mental models and frameworks for putting all this data into context. And a lot of people use research to that effect. So maybe I'll take those one at a time. Um, if you're looking for data, I would suggest uh, Coifin, which is a financial data service provider, you know, financial charts of Bitcoin, of all the crypto universe, stocks, bonds, rates, the dollar, whatever. Stockcharts.com is also very good. Uh, mm, yeah. Trading view is very good. Thinkorswim is pretty good. Um, and then I would also recommend looking at FRED, which is the Federal Reserve Economic Database. You can find it at FRED.com. It's got pretty much every piece of macro data which you, that you would want. You can download it into Excel. You can manipulate the data. Uh, you can you know run back tests, do whatever you want with it. I think that's really foundational. If you don't have access to that data, and it's very cheap, I mean, pretty much anyone can afford it. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to be a good investor without access to those things. And, and we're, we're lucky we live in a world where anyone can have access to the best data in the world and it costs basically nothing. I mean, Fred is completely free. You don't have to pay anything mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, hedge funds used to have informational advantage and access to better data than retail investors. And that's not the case anymore. Uh, really, where the edge lies now is analysis. So that takes me to my second point. You know, you, you, have, your, you have your data resources. Now, what do you need? Well, you need to you need to have some sort of mechanism for putting it all into context. So obviously I'm, you know, sort of biased. I think the macro handbook is a great place to start. You can find that linked in the bio of my Twitter page at Invictus Macro. You can also find it on our website at Invictus-Research.com. 
At Invictus, we also sell a course called Intro to Macro, which goes through a lot of the foundational principles of macroeconomic investing. It's really for beginners. It's meant to get you up to speed, take you from zero to hundred and you know, a week instead of taking three months and maybe not zero to hundred, that's a little unrealistic, but it'll, it'll be a huge amount of condensed learning in a short period of time. Um, you know, I hate to promote the CFA because I think that that's, uh, I have my problems with them, but it's, it's good for getting, uh, it's good for getting sort of the, the foundational financial concepts and whatnot. I'm a big proponent of the CMT. I think it's highly underrated. I think developing an intuition for the markets and how they trade is super valuable. Um, yeah. And then also I'll say Twitter. Twitter is an incredible resource. The problem with Twitter is that it's hard to curate like who's smart. If you don't have any contacts in finance, it's easy to get sort of swept away by charismatic uh, accounts that, that really aren't super knowledgeable. But if you can curate a list of good people to follow, uh, it can be terrific. So um, I don't know, maybe I can talk more about that later if you want. But um, there are some great accounts on Twitter that are provide tremendous resources basically for free. Yeah, I would say, guys, um, what Mike said is really true. Uh, be careful who you follow on Twitter. So make sure you follow Mike so you at least get uh, the good data and the good interpretation of the data on your Twitter feed. Uh, my, my trick is to, I follow a lot of people on Twitter. Most of them are, to be honest, noise. Uh, but I have a list with uh, people I really respect, people with a CFA or a CMT background or who are who have proven themselves in the field of macro and uh, the fundamentals. And I have like, um, I get notifications whenever they say something. Uh, and that helps to, uh, you know, um, to um, uh, to to don't get a lot of uh, to to protect myself from from the noise basically uh, because there are just a lot of misconceptions when it comes to uh, macro. Uh, what are you know from from your point of view, Mike? What are the biggest misconceptions uh, out there uh, when it comes to this uh, very topic of uh, macro? So I think there's two that come to the the forefront of my mind right away. The first is that macro needs to be complicated. Right, you like mm -hmm. you need to be trading derivatives on collateralized debt obligations or whatever, and that's not true. Pretty much, no matter what you do in financial markets, you're expressing a macro view. If you just bought an ETF for the S and P 500, you're expressing a macro view. You know, the thing is, most investors don't know it. So, becoming educated on the macroeconomic exposures that you're you're buying can help you make better investment decisions. Um, but but again, I guess what I'm trying to say is, it doesn't have to be complicated. Really, it just comes down to real growth inflation and monetary policy. And you can make those things as complicated as you want, but those are the those are the those are primary things things that you're working off of, right? And if you any analysis that you do, you should be able to relate back to those three things. And if you can't, well then it probably doesn't matter and it's probably kind of a low value analysis. Um, mm. The other big misconception I would say is that markets are random or inefficient. Um, and there's no point in doing any kind of fundamental analysis. And that can be disproven extremely easily, right? If you look at the year over year performance in the S&P 500 and you compare it to any measure of the growth cycle, if you look at the S&P 500 versus year over year GDP, the ISM manufacturing PMI, you know, the New York Fed's weekly economic index, they have very strong positive correlations. So what does that mean? Well, it means when economic growth is accelerating, when it's uh, going up faster, stocks tend to do better. And that's because earnings tend to go up faster, right? When the economy is accelerating, earnings tend to accelerate as well. And when the economy is decelerating, when it's slowing, stocks tend to perform worse. And maybe that sounds obvious, but there are so, so many investors that don't believe it. And you could perform a similar analysis of pretty much any other macro exposure, right? If you look mm -hmm. at commodity, the price of year over year price change in commodities, and you compare it to CPI inflation, it looks very, very, very similar. Why is that? Well, commodities really drive inflation. So it makes sense that they would look like uh, the government data for inflation. The big picture is if you don't believe that the fundamentals actually drive the price action, uh, you really shouldn't be investing in the first place. You certainly shouldn't be doing fundamental analysis because what's the point, right? The markets just yeah. are, you know, they're going to ignore whatever fundamentals you're looking at. Yeah. Um, luckily, that's not the case. If you can anticipate the fundamentals, you have a very, very good chance at getting the major trends and markets correct. Now, over the very short term, if you're kind of, a, you know, an intraday trader or you trade with a time horizon of under, call it a month, these big trends are going to be less important. But the primary trend, again, as Charles Dow would say, pretty much always fundamentally driven. You know, big technical trends always have big fundamental drivers.
I think it was Charles who said um, it's the, it's FA that drives the market and TA how we write the market, and, and that totally makes uh, sense. Uh, and to just to, to circle back a little bit uh, to what you said about um, the, the business cycle, uh, is there any uh, time duration, like an average time duration for each business cycle, or is that too random? So it really depends. It really depends on, you know, cycle to cycle, economic conditions, what the Fed's doing, what the Fed's policy goals are. Um, you know, you can have very short. We're going through a very short business cycle right now because, um, you know, COVID created this very fast deflationary impulse. Mm -hmm. The Fed and the U.S. federal government stimulated really aggressively, aggressively and we reopened the economy. Uh, which resulted in a very fast reflation and then inflation got too high and then they started tightening again. And, you know, all this has taken like three years. So you've gotten a very condensed business cycle. Of course, the business cycle after the great financial crisis was very, very slow, right? Like you got uh, a reflation coming out of the great financial crisis, but then the recovery after 2011 was extremely slow and we never had inflation over, you know, call it 2.2% or something. The Fed never really had to tighten policy conditions. And as a result, you just had this very slow, very low inflation expansion that took, you know, 10 years to play out. And every year there were folks saying, this is it. This is when we're going to see a recession. And it never happened because there was no impetus for a recession, right? You had an accommodated Fed, you had a slowly growing economy. Um, you know, you didn't have any kind of, uh, obviously there were no pandemics happening between 2010 and 2019. So it's, it's pretty variable. I can tell you that on average, economic accelerations tend to last about 18 months. Um, and economic decelerations tend to last a little bit less long than that, but it's it's pretty variable. Hmm. Super interesting. Uh, what's your take on the presidential cycle theory? Uh, is there some truth in it, or um, is that um, is it something that people should factor in when it comes to um, investing? So, I wouldn't say that we're experts on seasonality at Invictus. I will say that seasonality tends to play out more than you'd think, right? Every time, uh, you know, whenever I go through a cycle and I think like, oh, this is seasonally what should happen. Yeah. But, you know, it's not a super important input into our process. A lot of the time I'm like, wow, that was a, that was amazingly accurate. Mm. So I think, I think um, it's certainly worth having respect for seasonality. I mean, I can obviously tell you that November and December tend to be the two consecutive seasonally strongest months of the year. So what does that mean in terms of portfolio management? Well, for us, what it means is you don't want to be running your portfolio at like max net short into this, the seasonally strongest period of the year, unless you have a very good reason and kind of an acute catalyst. And, um, you know, right right now we don't. So I think that we, we can get more into our economic and market outlook uh, later if you'd like. We're not super bullish on the economy right now. That said, mm. we're not maxing out our shorts because look, it's a seasonally strong period of the year. We think that the economy probably has enough momentum to avoid being in an obvious recession through year end. Uh, and so the path of least resistance for the index, you know, I'm, we look at different time horizons. Actually, I think the S&P is a little overbought here and due for a pullback, but we don't think we're going to see like a recessionary uh, drop in markets over the next six weeks. Uh, in part, because there's just these seasonal tailwinds of people chasing performance into year end. And that's, exert sort of an upward gravity on stock prices. Hmm. Yeah, it makes, makes totally sense. Uh, There's actually a message to the, to the audience. Uh, make sure you hit the like button, but also follow Mike. Uh, Mike has something interesting to, uh, to show you guys. Uh, so a few slides that could help you with uh, gaining a better understand, understanding of, uh, of cycles. I know, Mike, you have prepared some beautiful slides for us. Should I pull them up? Mm. Voila. They're now on the screen. Uh, I'm gonna mm, click on full screen layout, which means, uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you can, you're now not able to see Mike's beautiful face, only uh, slides, but these slides are really beneficial, so pay attention. All right, are you gonna work through them or should I? uh th th this is interactive so you can also click on the on the on the next slide button otherwise i can do it for you yeah 
Okay, I, I can work through these if you want, and then you you just interrupt me if you have any questions or anything you want to interject. Yeah, yeah. So sure thing. this is uh, really what we talked about earlier. This is just some of my background. Um, you know, I worked at Broad Run. I'm a CFA charter holder. Blah blah blah. Whatever. I went to Notre Dame. It's a picture of me and my wife, and not pictured as our son John. Growth and inflation. Something that I didn't say earlier, but is important, is when you're evaluating real growth and inflation. You're not necessarily looking at the level so much as the rate of change. The rate of change is primary. The level matters too, especially for uh, evaluating the Fed's policy response to inflation. Uh, but but the rate of change is more important. So let me walk through sort of a hypothetical example. If economic growth is 5%, but it's about to crash to negative 5%, it doesn't matter that it's high uh, in terms of the absolute level. What matters is uh, the rate of change and where it's going. And that's a fine distinction that, again, maybe it sounds obvious, but to a lot of investors, it's not obvious and you really have to internalize it. The reason that the level matters more for inflation, you know, to be clear, the rate of change matters more in terms of financial market performance, but when the Fed is evaluating inflation, the level still matters. So in other words, if inflation is going to go from 5% to 4%, that is a rate of change deceleration, but the Fed doesn't want 4% inflation. The Fed wants 2% inflation. So you can't just consider the rate of change in that instance. Although again, financial markets primarily trade on the rate of change. Okay, this slide, we're just saying that, look, uh, you know, growth and inflation are all that matters. That's great. Hopefully that's, you know, kind of a relief because macro has a reputation for being so confusing, but it gets even better because growth and inflation aren't random. They're actually somewhat predictable because they are cyclical. And uh, if something cycles, what that means, essentially what that means is it trends and then peaks, trends and then troughs, trends and then peaks again, which is to say it trends and then mean reverts, uh, and then it trends and then it mean reverts, and then it trends and then it mean reverts. So uh, just understanding that basic principle can give you an edge in terms of trading financial markets. And if you understand the sequencing of the business cycle, uh, you can have an even more significant edge. And we'll get more into that in just a second. This is just a, a quick graphic showing you the three cycles. One implication of our, um, our growth and inflation framework is that there are four possible economic regimes, right? You can have an, uh, what we call early recovery when growth is accelerating and inflation is declining. That's a very good backdrop for, stock, for, for stocks and other risk assets. You know, Bitcoin tends to return 100% plus a year through early recoveries. Reflation is a bit more mature uh, stage in the recovery cycle, but it's still very good for stocks and uh, Bitcoin and other risk assets. It's when growth and inflation are accelerating together. Stagflation is when growth is declining, but inflation is accelerating. That tends to be, you know, it depends on how fast inflation is accelerating. It's certainly less good for business assets. And um, there are, the good news about stagflation is that there are other assets that do perform well, so particularly commodities. So at least there's something that goes up. Uh, you can still make money through stagflationary markets. Deflations are really tough. That's when growth and inflation are declining together. This is the regime that has the worst performance for risk assets. It's really the only regime where Bitcoin consistently earns negative returns. Um, and it's also the regime most consistent with recessions. Recessions are always and everywhere deflationary events, slower growth and slower inflation. Yeah. If you want to go back to the previous slide, there's like one one word I haven't heard before about like reflation. Um, how, how could we like determine a um, so reflation is when growth is going up and inflation is going up? Uh, but as you said, it's it's it, it's still in a it's this has uh, preceded the recovery phase. Have I understood that correctly? It doesn't precede the recovery. It usually follows the early recovery. Ah, okay. That's so, so this is actually the the sequencing of a, of a normal business cycle, right? Uh, through an early recovery, the economy has a lot of excess capacity. So you can grow without pushing against capacity constraints and causing inflation. Through a reflation, you have hot consumption. You have uh, the economy adding capacity. Uh, inflation is going up because it's hard to add capacity at the same pace as demand is accelerating. But things are more or less in balance. Stagflation, you have a hot nominal economy and you can't output, economic output can't keep pace at the same rate. So you have a lot of money chasing too few goods and services. And that's why you get you know, slower real growth, 
but inflation is still hot. You know, nominally growth is still hot. That's, yeah. you know, sounds kind of familiar because we've been going through a stagflationary period over the last couple of years. Are, are and then Mm -hmm. uh, sorry to interrupt, Mike. Um, very curious. Are we still in this stagflation uh, regime? So a lot of this depends on your time horizon, right? So, I mean, if you're looking at the year over year change in inflation, you know, we've gone from 9% inflation in June of 2022 to 3.3% inflation now. Uh, and economic growth has slowed more or less the whole time. So I think it'd probably be more accurate to say that we're in deflation. The reason it feels a lot like stagflation is because um, the services economy, uh, you know, restaurants, healthcare, financial services, entertainment and leisure, that part of the economy has seen very sticky inflation, which has required the Fed to keep monetary policy very tight. And so even though inflation is even though headline inflation is declining, there is a certain part of the economy, again, services, uh, where inflation is still, call it 5%, 5.5%. And uh, that's causing a lot of pain. And it's also causing the Fed to keep policy tight. So it feels a lot like the 1970s, even though technically, if you just looked at a chart, or if you looked at how most assets are trading, it's, it's more of a deflation. That's super interesting. What's your expectation for uh, the next two years? So uh, I think I'm going to go into that in some more detail. I'll get, I'll get more into that in some detail, but oh, basically yeah, sure we expect too. deflation over the coming call it year in large part because we expect a recession. Uh, great. <clears throat> it, it was one of the questions from the, from the audience. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Erica, this has answered your question and uh, stay tuned because we're going to cover way more. Okay, great. So this is an important slide because it's it's what I was saying earlier. This is the year-over-year -year change in the S&P 500 over the growth cycle. What do you notice? Well, the way stocks trade looks a lot like the growth cycle. The growth cycle drives the performance of stocks. On the bottom, you can see that the year-over-year -year change in commodities looks a lot like inflation. Again, that should be super logical. Um, markets trade on the fundamentals. That's the big takeaway here. This is a back test for the different economic regimes we were talking about earlier. Probably what I would highlight here is like, look, the returns by far are lowest in this deflation quadrant, right? The returns in early recovery, excellent. Reflation, excellent. Stagflation, less good. Energy performs very well. Um, everything else is, is much less good, right? The average return is less good. The percent positive ratio is less good. Your slugging percentage is less good. <clears throat> but again, deflation tends to be the worst. And then this slide, we're talking about monetary policy. All right, so let's talk about our outlook over the next year to two years. And before we do that, I'm gonna sort of talk about how we view the business cycle at Invictus and its sequencing. I've mentioned that phrase, cycle sequencing a few times. Here, we're gonna put a little bit more color around it. So how does a downdraft in the growth cycle start? Uh, a, decel a big deceleration. So. It usually starts with the Fed raising interest rates because inflation is running hot. We saw that at the beginning of at the end of 2021 and at the beginning of 2022, right? Annualized inflation was running at six or seven percent. The Fed said it's not transitory. We're going to need to do something about this. And they started communicating to markets that they were going to raise the Fed funds rate. You can see that on the left side of the slide. So when the Fed raises the policy rate, when the Fed raises the Fed funds rate, what happens? Well, obviously, the Fed funds rate goes up. But every other interest rate in the U.S. interest rate complex also goes up because the Fed funds rate is the policy rate. It's the benchmark rate for everything else. So higher Fed funds rate means a higher two-year yield, a higher, a higher five-year yield, it means a higher 30-year fixed mortgage rate. It means higher uh, debt on your credit card loans, higher debt on your auto loans, higher, higher debt on pretty much everything. Excuse me, higher interest rates on, those, on the debt for those different things. And one of the most important transmission mechanisms for Fed policy is the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. There's about a 93% correlation between the Fed funds rate and the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So when the 30-year fixed rate mortgage gets more expensive, when the rate goes from you know, sub 3% like it was in 20, early 2021 to you know, over 7% like it is now, that reduces demand for new mortgages and new home purchases right away because buying a house with a mortgage becomes more expensive. You know, this is in, in the US, pretty much all houses are purchased with mortgages. So if mortgages become less expensive and mortgage applications go down, naturally, total home sales are going to decline as well. 
for, that has knock-on effects. The housing market is a leading indicator, so it tends to have knock-on effects through the goods economy. Uh, and that impact is most notable in the durable goods economy. So durable goods are big, expensive, discretionary manufactured items with a useful life of longer than three years. So think a refrigerator, think furniture, think a washing machine, think uh, a dishwasher. Uh, these are the things that really drive the manufacturing cycle. So if demand for durable goods declines as a result of a weak housing market and higher rates, what do the manufacturers of all these goods do? Well, they have to cut production, right? Because demand is weak. And, um, you know, these businesses can't keep production low and they can't keep uh, running a business with progressively declining revenue forever. And so what they end up doing in order to maintain their margins is they start to lay workers off. And then from the main layoffs in the manufacturing sector transmit into weaker spending in the services sector, which transmits into, you know, basically broad economic weakness. And that's the business cycle. That's the, uh, the big picture. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go through these next slides and I'll show you what's happening right now. This is a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Um, these charts are slightly stale, like a couple of weeks, but they're still, things don't change that fast. These are still a very good indication of what's going on right now. So like I said earlier, mortgage rates were sub 3%, you know, in early 2021, and now they're almost 8%. That's a huge difference in terms of affordability. So how have consumers reacted? Well, on this slide, we're looking at mortgage applications and they're down 64% from their peak, right? There's 64% fewer mortgage applications today than there were, you know, a year and a half ago. Uh, and that's despite the fact that the economy is, you know, 20% bigger. So the housing market, demand in the housing market is just completely stagnant in the US. Another way of viewing that is through total home sales. This is the drawdown from the cycle peak. Excuse me. Um, total home sales are down 40% 40, 40 from their cycle peak. If you look back at historical recessions, in the in month one of the average recession, total home sales are down 21%. Obviously, they're down a lot more, a lot more than that now. So what that indicates is that the weakness in the housing market that we've seen in the US so far has been more than enough historically to induce a recession. And it's really, uh, in our mind, a question of the lags and how long it'll take to flow through to the broader economy. But we've seen tremendous weakness. You can see it's really only equaled by the housing crisis in 2008 and nine, and then the, uh, the Volcker tightening cycle in 1981 and two. Like I said earlier, the housing market's a leading indicator because it has knock-on effects into the goods economy. On this slide, you can see that total home sales tends to lead durable goods sales by about six months. <clears throat> and that's because, you know, when do you buy furniture? When do you buy a new dishwasher? Uh, you know, when do you buy these big, expensive, durable goods? Well, about 50% of the time, it's when you're moving. So, um, and a lot of times these, these items are financeable as well. And so they become less, less affordable as rates go up. So when the housing market freezes up, demand for durable goods freezes up as well. That's the big takeaway. Well, uh, th that makes so much sense. I, I wouldn't have made that conclusion myself, but it makes so much sense. Good, good. It's very, it's, I think it's all very logical. And if it ever is not logical, please stop me and I'll try and explain. Okay, so how are manufacturing companies reacting to this very soft demand, right? You can see it's, it's softening on this slide. We expect it to continue to soften. Manufacturers see that as well. How are they reacting to this, to this macroeconomic weakness? On this slide is a chart of industrial production and manufacturing production. We're looking at six month annualized uh, rates of change here. And you can see that we're negative. Uh, manufacturing companies and industrial companies are cutting production. In six month annualized terms, we're looking at, uh, let's see if I have it on here, I actually don't, but it's about negative 2% for both industrial production and manufacturing production. That's below the historical average in the first month of recessions. Historically, in the first month of recessions, we're, we're still looking at about 2% positive growth. So the fact that we're negative now means that the manufacturing economy has really gotten hit hard. So the big question now, I think, if you're following along is, are these manufacturing companies laying off workers, right? And demand is extremely weak. They're cutting production. When are they gonna cut headcount? <clears throat> Uh, you can see on this slide that they're cutting hours, right? You can see that average weekly hours for uh, private sector employees in the U.S. is down from, its, you know, 
about 35 hours in 2021 to under 34 and a half hours. Uh, currently, you can see that's a cycle low. You can see it's actually below the level one month prior to the great financial crisis. So we're, we're approaching recessionary levels and weekly hours work. But again, back to headcount. So when you look at cyclical employment, <clears throat> employment that's connected to the goods economy, uh, on this slide, we're looking at manufacturing, home building, temp services, and trucking. Um, we've seen layoffs, net layoffs in 10 of the last 12 months. So this is a net figure, which means it's net of new hires, which indicates that probably real layoffs are a little bit higher. Uh, cumulatively, we've looked at 210,000 net layoffs. So we are seeing layoffs in the sector. Uh, the business cycle is progressing as we would expect, given what I laid out earlier. I guess the real question now is, um, is this weakness likely to persist? And um, is it likely to metastasize into other sectors of the economy? Um, on this next slide, we're looking at the six month annualized change in cyclical employment. You can see it's contracting at a negative 1.3% annualized clip. If you look at the last four historical recessions in the first month, uh, historically, we've seen negative 3.6% growth. So this is to say we're, we're clearly at the end of the business cycle, right? We are seeing weakness in the labor market. We are seeing outright contraction and layoffs in the most cyclical parts of the labor market, but we're not seeing enough weakness to induce a full recession yet. Um, that's the takeaway from the slide. However, uh, we do expect to see a full recession soon. So on this slide is the unemployment rate and the NAHB Home Builder Sentiment Index inverted and leading by 18 months. You can see that the Home Builder Index leads the unemployment rate by 18 months. It's got uh, pre-COVID, it had a negative 88% correlation and an R squared of 0.77. Those are extremely high numbers. Those are numbers that you really, really want to pay attention to if you're following markets in the economy and the business cycle. Um, and so I think what this chart is telling us is, look, the weakness that we've seen in the cyclical parts of the economy, the interest rate sensitive parts of the economy, you know, housing, manufacturing, trucking services, where you move goods around the, the country, the weakness that we've seen uh, will be adequate to induce higher levels of unemployment. And that's my Bitcoin chart. If you were to actually run a regression, what it implies is that you know, through year end, we're going to see uh, the unemployment rate 4% or lower. So we're not really going to see weakness in 2023 at the headline level. We'll probably still see weakness under the hood, right, in these cyclical sectors, but it's not going to hit the headline level until the beginning of 2024. Then we're going to see considerable layoffs and considerable increases in the unemployment rate through late summer of 2024. Um, you know, this model in particular suggests a peak in the headline unemployment rate of 7.3%. That's more than a doubling off of the cycle trough, which is 3.4%. So that's really something that we have to take seriously. That indicates a more than or a worse than average recession. <clears throat> All right. So that's the end of my, that's actually the end of my business cycle segment. So if there are any questions about that, it's a good time to pause before I move on to Bitcoin. Uh, there are no questions from my end. Uh... Audience, if there is, if there are any questions, uh, drop them in the comment box. Uh, but I think your uh, Bitcoin chart is um, um, how do you call that? Uh, I, I think we all wait for that. Okay, great. Then I can just keep going, and and yeah. any questions yeah. can happen at the end. Yeah. All right. So this is Bitcoin. <clears throat> Where do we see the important levels at Invictus? Well, thirty-one thousand was clearly an important level. Uh, we saw a breakout a few weeks ago where uh, we see resistance now at $41,000 a coin. So, you know, you know, what do we do with this? Um, you know, a breakout is a breakout and a breakout is bullish. So there's, there's that. That said, tactically, is this a great spot to be adding exposure to Bitcoin? Not really in our view. I mean, it's right in between support and resistance. It's kind of no man's land. Candidly, we expect it to hit 41,000. Um, but the question from there is, do we see a breakout above 41,000? Do we have a chance to add into a new bull market? Or is this a chance to sort of sell the strength, um, main, preserve your capital into the next cycle, and hopefully you know, deploy a lot more cash off the lows? And Victus, we think it's probably the latter. And the reason for that is Bitcoin is a very macroeconomically sensitive asset. On this slide, you can see that the Bitcoin that Bitcoin has 
a, a very close inverse correlation with the dollar. So the dollar, uh, when the dollar goes up, Bitcoin goes down. And when the dollar goes down, Bitcoin goes up. <clears throat> if you look at the right side of the chart, you can see um, this recent run we've seen in Bitcoin has coincided with weakness in the dollar. So, uh, you know, to, to be clear, strategically, you know, over the long term, over the next 10 or 20 years, we are bullish on Bitcoin at Invictus. That said, uh, tactically, it's hard to be bullish here given the macroeconomic sensi sensitivities uh, that it has. We expect the dollar probably to appreciate. <clears throat> Historically, the reason for that has been, you know, the dollar is what everyone globally uses to pay their bills. You know, a lot of emerging market countries have dollar denominated debts called euro dollar debts, which means that they have to pay their interest in dollars. So if there's a global slowdown, what they end up doing is fire selling their other assets, gold, commodities, other foreign currency reserves, whatever, because they have to meet their dollar denominated interest payments or else they default on their debt and they get shut out of the capital markets. And so through pretty much every recession for the last 40 years, what you've seen is a dollar squeeze. Now, given our view that we, you know, we think that we're going to be in a recession. You know, we could be in a recession in December, but we don't think it'll be clear until Q1, Q2 of 2024. Given that's our view, um, you know, we don't really want to be short the dollar. We'd actually be looking to add to the dollar and, um, you know, sell on strength or Bitcoin. Like we said, it could go to 41,000, you know, very easily over the next couple of months, but we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be buying, looking to buy that breakout. We'd be looking to, to, to sell the strength. Bitcoin is also, um, the point of this slide is just to show you that Bitcoin uh, has significant macroeconomic sensitivities. You can see the inverse correlation with the 10 year real rate is very, very close. Real rates have been trending higher. Uh, we can talk about interest rate dynamics more uh, later if you would like, but this is just good to keep in the back of your mind if you're trading Bitcoin. <clears throat> Bitcoin is also pro-cyclical with economic growth. So this is the New York Fed's weekly economic growth index. So what does this mean? It means that you know, when the economy is accelerating, Bitcoin, Bitcoin tends to do very, very well. And when the economy is decelerating, Bitcoin tends to do a lot less well. Um, you can also see that this latest round of strength in Bitcoin has coincided with sort of a slow acceleration in economic growth. Now, that said, because we expect economic growth to decline at Invictus, uh, we think that economic conditions are going to be a headwind for its performance. So, you know, this is all to say, while we are optimistic on Bitcoin over the long run, given the mix of economic conditions being negative, um, policy conditions being negative, it's uh, it's hard to get excited about it as a risk reward tactically. Yeah, yeah, I, I do understand that perspective. Uh, how, how, um, maybe this is a little bit, you know, uh, able from from like a technical uh, point of view. Uh, was a like a a halving that's uh, coming in April. Uh, could that you know um, break this strong correlation that it has with uh, the weekly econo economic uh, index data and the the, the strong uh, cruel, uh, inverse correlationship it has with uh, with the dollar? So this is the way I think about it. So there are just different factors that drive the performance of Bitcoin and they are respectively headwinds and tailwinds. So it's like a tug of war almost between the headwinds and the tailwinds. If growth is declining, that will put downward pressure on the price of Bitcoin no matter what. Now, the impact of the halvening might be greater than the impact of economic weakness. That's certainly possible, um, but that's not something about which we have a differentiated view at Invictus. You know, our differentiated view is, is, is you know, really about economic weakness. And so from a macro perspective, we think it's probably, I don't want to say short because the technical setup isn't, isn't good for a short, um, but the, the macroeconomic setup is bad enough that we're not looking to add to Bitcoin right now. Um, not to say we can't be wrong. A great trader is only right about 55, maybe 60% of the time if they're really, really good. So, uh, you know, we're, we're simply, at Invictus, we're simply trying to create the highest probability setups and that means we're going to be wrong 40, 45 percent of the time. And we know that and we're willing to accept it. You know, Bitcoin could go to 100,000 from here, but the risk reward isn't good right here. You know, that's a, a distinction that you have to appreciate. Yeah. So uh, with 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 this data um, and when it comes like to, you know, rotation from one one asset class to the to the other, 
um looking forward to 2024 which uh what what's the let's say like the the safer bet like is it commodities um currencies so i think if you're <clears throat> You know, if you're tactical, if you're very tactical, like you have a time horizon under a month or six weeks, you can have exposure to risk here, right? You could be, yeah. Look, I just say if you're tactical, you can still have exposure to risk here. We don't see a recession hitting the markets for another month or six weeks at least, right? So you can trade around risk assets and still make money uh, yeah. for sure. If you have a longer term time horizon, I would say that this is a good time to be either positioning defensively or getting ready to position defensively. So what does that mean? It probably, within your equity book, within your stock portfolio, it means going up the market cap spectrum, uh, which we've been doing for a while, right? Large cap, mega cap, less small cap, less micro cap. You wanna be buying companies with strong balance sheets, you know, low leverage. Um, eventually you're gonna wanna start to move into <clears throat> defensive sector exposures. So think consumer staples, utilities, real estate, healthcare, not yet. Uh, you know, the technicals for those are pretty bad still, largely because of higher interest rates, which is another dynamic we could get into. Um, but eventually you're gonna start wanting to look toward those defensive sectors and you're gonna wanna look away from the more cyclical sectors like consumer discretionary and industrials and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah Within bonds, yeah. sorry. Yeah, it makes totally sense. And then I was just going to say within bonds, our preference at Invictus is for short term, low credit risk exposures. So we like treasury bills. We think, look, a five and a half percent nominally risk free yield at this location in the cycle is pretty good. You can squeeze out an extra 100 basis points of yield or, you know, maybe 70 basis points of yield by looking at short term high grade debt. Um, so we're happy to look at certain types of corporate debt as well. What we don't really want right now uh, is long term. Uh, long-term debt, either long-term treasuries or long-term corporate bonds. Uh, and again, we, we can go more into the reasons for that uh, later if you would like. Eventually, you will want to own those things when a recession is imminent, you know, when you can really see the whites of the eyes of this recession, but not right now. Yeah, I, I think there's one thing that keeps a lot of people awake and uh, that's like the interest rate hikes uh, and interest rate. Um, I, I think the audience would appreciate it if you could uh, touch on that a little bit. Okay, interest rate hikes. <clears throat> so, or, or interest rate in you know in, in in general. Sure, I mean interest rates are extremely important. You know, Warren Buffett famously said that interest rates are like gravity for for stocks and for other risk assets. When interest rates go up, it puts downward pressure on everything else. So, I guess here's the way I'll take it. You know, will the Fed hike again? You know, it depends on how quickly this recession comes. I mean, I think that it's, I'll say this, look, I think it's more likely that we see one one more hike in the next three months than one more cut. You know, why do I say that? Well, because services inflation, uh, X energy, which is about 60% of consumer spending is still inflating at over 5% on a three month annualized basis and on a year over year basis, actually, right? Most of the disinflation that we've seen has been in durable goods right? Mm -hmm. Furniture, refrigerators, the stuff that we were talking about earlier that's sensitive to the housing cycle because the housing market is crashing, right? No housing activity means no demand for those other goods, which means prices go down. Services has been much stickier. And um, over time, unless the Fed continues to raise interest rates at the same pace, you're going to see durable goods inflation start to normalize, right? And so if you see durable goods inflation normalize while well, services inflation is still running at 5%, that means you're going to see the headline inflation data start to, to look more like services over time, to, to gravitate toward 5%. That's an outcome the Fed does not want at all, right? It doesn't want inflation to bottom at 3 or 3.5% 3 .5 and then start drifting toward 5%. So yeah. given that, uh, we think the odds of a 25 basis point uh, rate hike are higher than is currently being priced in by the market. Right now, the market is pricing in basically a 0% chance of another hike. And Victor would say... It's probably, I don't know, a 30% chance of another hike, C certainly higher than what's being priced in 40%. Now, if you're going to position your portfolio for higher rates, you have to be aware of recession risk because, you know, once there's clear evidence of a recession, the Fed is going to cut and long duration assets are going to outperform short duration assets. So uh, 
it sounds a little bit like a cop out, but you really have to be nimble here. You have to understand how the Fed views markets and how it interprets economic data uh, so that you can stay one step ahead of them in terms of uh, making asset allocation decisions. Makes uh, makes so much sense, uh, Mike. You've been so generous with your uh, alpha, your, uh, uh, you know, with going through these slides and with your uh, information and uh, knowledge you have uh, shared with us. Uh, you know, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to share some some you know some some insights some um so some some alpha that people need to take into consideration uh before you know before we uh, move forward to the to the next quarter so i would say um you know i'm by i'm a little bit biased but what i'd say is you know almost there's no higher leverage activity for an investor than understanding the business cycle right like i said all asset classes trade on the same information, growth, inflation, and monetary policy. So if you get those three things right, or even if you only get two of them right, you're gonna get a lot of other stuff right as well. And so when you're thinking about how to allocate you know, your research time as an investment decision maker, uh, in my opinion, there's really no better use of time than getting up to speed on the business cycle. So I would just encourage everyone, whether you're using Invictus or another resource, uh, it, it's a very, very good use of time. And and for me personally, it's certainly been the best uh, re research process uh, improvement I've made over the course of my investment career. Yeah, I very much agree. I, I've, I've seen the, the macro handbook. Could you tell our audience how they can access this uh, macro handbook? So it's in the bio of my Twitter profile at Invictus Macro. And then it's also available on the website. You might need to scroll scroll a little bit to get to it, but it's at invictus-research.com. So for those who are paying attention, this is the link to Mike's Twitter account. And there in his bio, you can check out for free a macro handbook that touches on the three pillars and talks again you know uh it goes also in depth about you know stagflation reflation inflation uh interest rates uh and all of that definitely uh, worthwhile to visit it i i've i've read the handbook yesterday uh learned uh, a lot of things and i'm pretty sure a lot of people will find it extremely insightful uh to have this pdf it's also really to uh, to read by the way mike even though this is about fundamentals it's um you know reading this it's it's um it's just like water it's it, you guys don't use an extremely complex words it's um pretty uh how to say it like self-explanatory uh so also kudos uh, for that uh, big shout out for uh you know having this uh, handbook which is really accessible but also really digestible i've seen a lot of different handbooks or books that they they are so heavy but also so um intense to go uh to really absorb that information but this is written in such a way that's really easy to you know uh to wrap your head at around it so thank you for uh sharing this with us uh so again guys go to his twitter uh give him a follow at least uh be grateful give him a follow uh download that handbook and read it read it and read it uh mike thank you again so much uh you, it was absolutely a pleasure to have you here as a guest we have learned so much about macro you simplified macro to those who you know who envisioned actually macro as a really complex things uh, complex thing you made it really easy for us again thank you very much and uh, we would be happy to have you uh, again in one of our next shows oh my, my pleasure thank you again jimmy more than welcome uh, to those who are still listening, guys, you guys are really champions. Uh, you guys have learned a lot. We do share a lot of other stuff uh, on Discord, uh, a lot of trade setups, a lot of insights, a lot of uh, alpha for you. So check us out. And happy to see you guys soon. Bye-bye.